Good afternoon, uh, or <clears throat> good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're watching us from. <clears throat> I'm Roland Green, director of the Stanford Humanities Center, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the second event in our Digital Horizons series. <clears throat> this new series was launched last spring and is a joint venture between the Humanities Center and our partner, the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis, SESTA. In addition to those of you who are here in Leventhal Hall, we have many more people in our online audience, including a number of former fellows. Hello, former fellows. And I wanna say to all of you how glad we are to have you back uh, with us again virtually. Uh, but whoever you are, whether you're a past or former, uh, past or current fellow, whether you're a member of the Stanford community, or maybe like many of us, you're just a survivor of the pandemic who wants to make sense of what happened to us the past two years, we hope you will join us uh, often after today. Before we begin, I would like to mention to our Zoom audience that real-time captioning is available. Please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom where it says CC to start or stop viewing the captioning. The up arrow adjacent to the CC icon permits you to show subtitles, view the full transcript and adjust captions as needed. As many of you know, this institution, the Stanford Humanities Center is unusual among university-based humanity centers in that we uh, do at least three different things uh, all the time. We house a large number of fellows who are working on their own projects. This year, we have nearly 50 of them under our roof. We sponsor research workshops to foster collaboration, and we offer events like this that are open to the, the community, the Stanford community, and beyond. Many of our peer institutions divide these functions among two or more centers. We're among the very few that sponsor all three. We hope that these activities complement and improve each other. The fellows find their work enlivened by the visiting speakers. The visitors encounter a receptive audience that includes not only Stanford scholars and students, but many others who have met for the year at this crossroads. And in our public events, our hy the hybrid format is our new normal. Um, we are pleased to be able to connect you who are here in person with those of you who are here virtually. And as I said, current and former fellows, faculty, former students, alumni, in both in-person and online conversation. Before we move to the introduction of our speaker, one more reminder, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after the talk. And I hope those of you who are here in person will stay for the reception afterward. And for members of our virtual audience who want to submit a question to the speaker, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and we will do our best to get to it following the lecture. Also, please note that today's event is being recorded and will be available on our website in the coming days. And now to tell you something about our speaker, Professor So, let me turn it over to my colleague, Giovanna Cesarani, the director of SESTA. Hello, everyone. It's really good to see you all here in person. And hello to the Zoom audience as well. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Richard So, visiting us from Montreal, where he is the Associate Professor of English and Cultural Analytics at McGill University. Professor So is the author of two monographs, two edited special journal issues, and more than 20 articles and essays that have appeared in various literary academic journals, as well as in The Atlantic, Slate, and The New York Times. His most recent book, published in 2020, is called Redlining Culture, a data history of racial inequality and post-war fiction. This is a book that draws on big data, literary history, and close reading in order to offer an unprecedented analysis of racial inequality in the world of American publishing. Professor So puts data computational analysis in his work in conjunction with more traditional methods in order to reconcile critical race theory 
with digital approaches to the study of literature. Methods such as statistical methods and natural language processing. As a digital humanist, therefore, he has also been at the forefront of bringing these specialized approaches to the attention of a wider public, which is so important in these years, and we are also grateful for. And Professor So is currently at work on a new book project in which he studies the impact of social media and user-generated content on how we talk about race. It is from this ongoing research, which combines cultural criticism and data science that is drawing for his timely talk today. The talk is titled, How a Pandemic Becomes a Story, Narrative and Social Crisis in the Platform Age. And with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Richardson. Thank you, Giovanna, for that truly uh, generous introduction. And um, thank you to also uh, Roland, for the both of you for inviting me, and uh, Eric Ortiz for so ably organizing my visit. Um, when I received your invitation, I was, I was really delighted and thrilled. Um, this collaboration between the Humanity Center and SESTA, or more broadly, the humanities and computer science, information science, to me is a really vibrant, really important meeting um, that we collectively need to really think through about how we want to do this uh, moving forward. And I feel really grateful that um, I have a chance to present some work that is uh, trying to think towards that um, in my research. Uh, so I think that's um, everyone I want to thank. Thank you uh, for coming. Uh, how a pandemic becomes a story. Um, and you can start the slides for the webinar, people. Great, thanks. In the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic, as borders and then doors and bodies shut down, everyone was in search of answers, stuck inside their homes in virtual spaces. People poured over case count statistics and doom scrolled for signs of life underneath the new normal. Some looked to the past to see how others had survived the radical upending of their lives by disease. In the UK, for example, sales of uh, the plague jump uh, from 371 copies in February uh, to 2,156 by late March. In April, um, Orhan Pamuk, Nobel Prize winning author, busy with his own historical plague novel, wrote in the New York Times about what the great pandemic novels teach us. Times of uncertainty and upheaval often find us turning to fiction to imagine how they might end. At the start of our most recent crisis, this impulse seemed natural enough that uh, one literary editor um, decided to sneak in a mention of COVID-19 into Don DeLillo's The Silence, completed just weeks before the pandemic had tightened its grip. If DeLillo was not in a position to respond to the moment, his editor would do it for him, fulfilling the public's collective yearning for answers. DeLillo flatly rejected the intrusion. Never mind that his novel narrates a near future moment of global rupture when the world's electronic systems inexplicably shut down in the novel, a small cast of characters are left to reassess their entire relation to society and to their digital devices. As DeLillo put it, someone else could have decided that it made it more contemporary, but I said, there's no reason for that. His refusal to write, rewrite for the moment feeds into recent critiques of the contemporary novel as out of touch with the present, critiques that range from the polemical, as in David Shields' railings against well-wrought literary novels as nostalgic works that, quote, in no way convey what it feels to live in the 21st century, to um, more recently, uh, the empirical, as um, James English has shown in a recent study a shift in late 19th century prestige novels towards historical settings and away from the contemporary. So you can see a linear, linear downward trend in terms of um, contemporary settings. At the same time, these critiques issue an injunction to pay attention to the technological and material ways in which writing has more broadly changed over the past decade. Such changes include social media, and new online writing platforms like Wattpad, which is going to be the subject of my talk today, and how they've altered the nature of publishing, 
cultural value and what it means to write today. My talk today will take up this injunction. DeLillo may have declined to update his novel to the crisis unfolding around him, but ordinary readers didn't have to wait for him or other established professional novelists to respond. They could look to their own community of fellow readers who contribute to online story pl pl storytelling platforms like an archive of our own or Wattpad and who were prepared to respond to, to the pandemic from day one. Indeed, these so-called producers of culture, individuals who act simultaneously both as producers and consumers of culture, have spent a decade learning how to publish for the moment and respond quickly to shifts in the social narrative, while generating enormous amounts of original as well as fan fiction online, they've also learned how to generate virtual community through forms of sociology unique to the platform era, sharing, commenting, liking, linking, and the allure participating within an instantaneous simultaneity. How did these online users respond to COVID? User-generated stories like Lockdown on London Lane, published in installments on Wattpad.com in the spring of 2020, provide some intriguing glimpses. Over 25 chapters, the, the story narrates what happens to a group of 20-somethings when their apartment building on London Lane is locked down, and they must endure a week of quarantine together. Various social dramas predictably quickly unfold, friendships dissolve, new romances blossom, people quit their jobs. But the story is perhaps most interesting at the granular perceptual level. In one scene, the narrator describes in detail the strange way that her apartment now sounds, a kind of sonic intimacy previously unnoticed. Quote, it goes one in the morning when I give up trying to sleep, cocoon myself in the duvet and shuffle out to the living room. The duvet drags behind me. The fabric whispering over the laminate flooring. It seems so loud in the silence of the flats. A familiar feeling. The fabric's melancholic whispering, of course, conjures a long for human intimacy, largely erased by quarantine. Lockdown on London Lane and other stories like it capture in real time the ways that living in isolation has altered our basic capacity to feel, observe, and hear. Literary and cultural studies have only begun to recognize the massive amount of writing generated on online platforms and its significance for contemporary literary practice. The COVID-19 pandemic is a chance to test our understanding of this material against the backdrop of a critical rupture in the social fabric that unfolded over months in ways that were impossible to predict. It's a similarly dramatic rupture that prompts one of DeLillo's characters to ask, with all electronic devices shut down, what happens to people who live inside their phones? Here I ask the opposite question. What happens when the devices are all we have? Just as DeLillo refused to narrate what had only just begun, thousands of others grabbed their laptops and phones to write about an event with no clear ending. How did they tell their stories on the fly, ad hoc, in media stress? How do you tell a story before you know how it's going to end? Hashtag COVID also presents a second research opportunity. Uh, Mark McGurl, um, who teaches at Stanford here, has written a terrific recent study of what he calls fiction in the age of Amazon. The contemporary cultural market is saturated by popular genre fiction, such as say, romance, science fiction, because fiction today, as McGurl argues, has become, quote, an adjunct to online retail, where writers are expected to give readers what they want as a form of customer service. What readers want, much like the other things they buy on Amazon.com, are things that they know already work. Stories with a set formula or set or a set of characters or themes, stories that provide reliable customer satisfaction. McGurl is interested in the regularization of the literary marketplace as an effect of the transformation of the labor market to one focus on service rather than goods. Here, I'm interested in the reverse. How do, new, how do new kinds of stories or genres emerge in a marketplace increasingly defined by standardization in response to social crisis and change? And last, COVID presents, hashtag COVID presents a methodological opportunity. 
writing and reading on platforms like Wattpad and Twitter and Facebook happens at multiple scales. There is a scale of the individual story, what the individual writer and reader knows and sees. In close reading as a mirror of that form of cognition is an effective form of analysis to see what they see. But writing and reading also happens at the scale of thousands of writers, readers, and stories, how they aggregate to produce community level effects. For this, we need a computational approach, one that can read at the scale of the platform, discerning patterns of language and narrative across stories to see what inevitably no individual person can see, but certainly exists. This is also the scale by which literary genre operates, both established genres like say romance and new genres like hashtag COVID that are striving to emerge. In this talk, I'll argue that forms of writing that operate at multiple scales require an approach that works at multiple scales. Born digital culture requires born digital methods. Within the pandemic's first two months, over 250 COVID-related stories have been posted to Wattpad. They range from informational tracks, how to survive the coronavirus, to diaristic accounts, the quarantine diaries, uh, to sci-fi horror narratives, corona zombies, to fan fiction, um, of course, 30 Shades of Quarantine. <laughs> which I read, which is actually quite fantastic. By March, there were 2,000 such stories in English alone. This number is just a fraction, though, of the more than 565 million, 565 million stories hosted on the site as of 2021 and read by upwards of 9 million unique users. Founded in 2006 in Canada as a site to share stories via mobile phone, Wattpad has since become a multi-million dollar, multi dollar BMF that publishes in over 50 languages and where amateur writers, mostly under 30 and female, post and receive feedback on the stories they wish to tell. With its growing popularity, the platform is increasingly impacting more mainstream cultural industries. So uh, writers like Margaret Atwood have championed the website. Uh, major entertainment conglomerates like Sony have partnered with Wattpad as a way to scout young writing talent. And I wanna again underscore um, 80,000 stories are uploaded every day. 80,000 stories are uploaded every day. Uh, so scholars like Sarah Brulette have begun to study this real-time mass writing and its affordances for cultural production. She and others use individual case studies to show how online platforms are becoming increasingly interconnected with other spheres of narrative production like TV and books. Um, they facilitate an informal sharing economy between amateur writers, but, but can also be engines of commercialization that mine user data to identify and profit from popular works as part of a kind of pan entertainment uh, business models. Um, amateur authors have naturally benefited from this process with some proactively leveraging the platforms to build relationships and nurture their own micro celebrity. But such success stories are really quite rare um, and they're dwarfed by the millions and millions and millions who read and write for these platforms with little to no expectation of financial or reputation. They just do because it's fun. And that's the vast majority of people on Wattpad and these, and these platforms. Many flock to these sites simply to take part in interactive and dynamic communities. Dedicate, they just do it because they love doing it. Um, and that's what I wanna study. Pandemics of course represent a specific type of social event and thus prompt a specific type of storytelling and world making. They exhibit a dramaturgic form, as Charles Rosenberg notes, in that they, quote, start at a moment in time, proceed on a stage limited in space and duration, following a plot line of increasing and revelatory tension, move to a crisis of individual and collective character, then drift towards closure. So that's one version. Uh, and more recent popular aesthetic treatments have turned to this form, have turned this form into the outbreak or contagion narrative, which according to Priscilla Wald, so this is Wald, um, follows a formulaic plot that begins with the identification of an emerging infection, includes discussion of the global networks throughout which it travels and chronicles the ep 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 epistemological work that ends with its containment. Uh, writing a pandemic in a moment, however, is not likely to lead to such clear beginnings and then this is totally something different. Uh, but also during the uh, Spanish flu pandemic, 
Uh, Elizabeth Uka observes that novelists diverge from the linear outbreak narrative because the flu appeared to emerge everywhere all at once. It was not truly contained, leaving as mysteriously as it arrived. As a result, the event is uh, typically figured as a, quote, spectral trauma, uh, lacking a distinct plot or clearly defined human agent. So these are just some existing models to think about pandemics in cultural narratives. Um, but again, Wattpad is something different. In the first few months of 2020, a set of tags emerged related to the pandemic. So it's kind of out of nowhere. Uh, this included hashtag COVID, hashtag COVID-19, hashtag coronavirus, which took on the function of higher level genre tags, but which were also combined with keyword, uh, keyword like tags ranging from the serious, like hashtag pandemic, to the silly, quote, loving within the corona. Um, after collecting, um, so this is our data, after collecting English language works assigned uh, one of the three higher level tags, so like hashtag COVID, and uploaded or modified between March 2020 and February 2021, and after filtering works shorter than 1,000 words, uh, we ended up with um, this data. Um, so at this initial stage, hashtag COVID story is defined purely by a social signal. The next step was to under understand how the signal related to the content of the stories themselves and to see whether there was any discernible pattern to this. So um, just some surface shallow analysis. Oh, and I should also mention um, that Wattpad uses an algorithm to determine what readers can see and read. And thus the entire process of reading on the platform is in part shaped by algorithmic confounding. Um, so for now, I'm gonna bracket this question, but I'm happy to talk about this in the Q and A because I think it's actually, the algorithm question and the mass reader response question, they're actually uh, intricately tied together. And I'll be happy to talk about in the Q&A. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna be talking about the reader part of it. So reading them up close, COVID stories seem to have, have little shared structure at all. They are, there are intensely personal firsthand accounts of life in quarantine or the experience of being on a ventilator, journalistic texts that aim to compile and synthesize information about the pandemic as it comes in, and speculative fictions that play out the future of COVID-19 uh, to a variety of effective ends. But viewed in aggr aggregate, however, some patterns do emerge. So uh, leveraging the site's metadata, we learned that 40% of the authors created their accounts after January 2020, suggesting that they came to the site after the pandemic was underway, perhaps to simply document or discuss the event. They wanted to be on Wattpad to talk about this. But the majority were already on the site. Indeed, the median number of works published pre-COVID authors is four, double that of post-COVID authors. So digging into this data just a bit more, we also learned that there are distinctive surges in when COVID stories were created and mass modified. So this slide plots the distribution of hashtag COVID story creation dates overall, and then, and then split by whether the author's username was created prior to or after January 2020. Um, this next slide plots the last modification dates overall, and then split by author status the first two figures show that for both uh, groups of users, the earliest months of the pandemic were the most critical for initial story generation. So that's this slide. But in, in this slide, we observe a bimodal split indicating that a good portion of stories were never updated after the early months of the pandemic, while many more updated, updated over an extended period with a significant peak at the half year mark. So that's kind of interesting. So um, some wrote only for that initial moment. That's one group when the world was turned upside down, while others kept coming back to update their stories. So different behaviors. Across the corpus, 50% of the stories span 31 days or less between creation and last modification, while the top 25% range between 92 and 305 days between uh, when they started stories and when they chose to finish them. Still, Despite these indications of behavioral patterns, we're still in the dark about the degree to which COVID stories were about the pandemic at all. How is it manifesting as a focus of narrative attention? Some were clearly approaching it through a documentary mode, a kind of autofiction of the moment, while others were weaving into more structured narratives. But in what proportion and at what point in the pandemic? In the later case, were writers falling back to generic norms like romance in writing the pandemic through these norms, creating variations on a, on a kind of love in the time of COVID to arrive at a more granular understanding of how the pandemic was or wasn't surfacing in these stories. 
and the interaction between narrative focus and user behavior, we did a more explicitly text focused model. So now I'm going to be getting into um, a more complicated model. So, so at the most fundamental level, this is this is how my collaborators and I thought about COVID stories. COVID writers had to, had had to make choices about the what was the story going to be about and how do you want to tell the story. What literary theorists would call COVID's fabula and Suzette. In terms of the what, one key choice facing COVID authors was whether to reference the pandemic directly or to treat it as a background noise, an unnamed but ever present shadow. Do you want your story to really be about COVID? Or is it not about COVID? And that's what makes it COVID. So we create a first variable called COVIDness. Sorry, this is, this, is, this actually really works well. So to measure this effect, whether an author's COVID story was explicitly about COVID, uh, to measure this, um, con i.e. contains direct mentions of the disease or related phenomena like quarantine, or simply is unnamed context. So we gathered a large corpus of newspaper articles from the same period as our stories of New York Times and Wall Street Journal. We built a language model that quantifies how much of this explicitly journalistic discourse about COVID-19 exists in each COVID story. And I'm happy to get into the details um, about this in, in the Q&A. We used a topic model and then did some modeling on top of that. Uh, so yeah, we did this using a joint topic model, both newspaper articles and Wattpad stories, which I'd be happy to talk more about in the Q&A. So our, our variable for this effect is binary. Above a th certain threshold, um, and the story is about COVID-19. Below that threshold, it's not. Um, and this slide, we show an, an excerpt from a story that contains a very high degree of explicit COVID discourse. So you can see that this is clearly um, in part about COVID. In terms of the how of COVID stories, how are they organized and narrowed? How are they told? Um, an area where the, likely, the pandemic likely had a significant impact was the imagination of sociality, which this, we just ex experienced it, right? That when I was alone or with my partner, I thought a lot about people and why I couldn't see people and how many people I could see each day and so forth. For the majority of people, the event was arguably experienced not through the effects of COVID-19 itself, even if you got sick, but through the fierce limiting of personal interaction to help curb the, 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 the disease's spread. We wonder this, if this experience might be reflected in COVID authors' decision about how to populate their narratives, the kind of world space of their stories. Would they try to narrate the conditions of quarantine and lockdowns with isolated characters suddenly bereft of social connection? Do you want your stories to be lonely? Or would they opt for the opposite, a full cast of characters embedded in rich social networks, reflecting the desire for a form of, for a form of human connection denied in the context of the author's actual lives. I thought about this a lot as I was watching TV shows like every day for hours during the early days of the pandemic. Did I want to watch TV shows with a lot of sociality or, or not? And I can't remember, but that seems to be an important question about how you tell the story of COVID. So we created um, a second variable to measure this effect called sociality. Um, so I, I wrote an algorithm that turns every COVID story into a social network where a character is connected to another character if they are present together or interact within the diegesis of the story. And in the q and I'd be happy to talk about how I um, operationalize this. Um, so for a story to have a social network, it must feature at least three characters, each having an interaction uh, with the other. Otherwise, we identify the story as not having a social network. So uh, the simplest way, I give you some examples of this in this slide. So for example, a story that has 10 characters, but none of them interact or present together in the story, um, or a story that only has two characters present within, each, within that story, and they can interact as much as they want, but that's it. It's just a pair form. Um, or of course, a story with only like a narrator uh, will have um, a zero sociality score. By contrast, um, a story like Lockdown in London Lane, which has a lot of people interacting, a bunch of millennials having their dramas during COVID, that's gonna have um, a positive sociality score. Um, and um, after that, just for uh, the people uh, interested in statistical modeling, we had to have a bunch of control variables, which I mentioned, uh, just, just to make sure that what we're seeing is not driven by obvious variables, like how long the story is, was the story popular? Um, we just had to control for those effects. Okay, 
because we're really interested in these two variables, how they, how they, um, how they are associated with different kinds of uh, code stories. So um, with these variables in our model now defined, we can explore our major research question. How did large groups of people on the internet internalize COVID-19 as a narrative or story? As a pandemic unfolded over 2020 and 2021, how did that story assume specific qualities or features? And as people learn more about the disease increasingly become subject to a state mandated response to quarantine, how did that story change? The more you know about COVID, how did it, make, how did it change your imagination of COVID? So here I'm interested in hashtag COVID as a set of evolving aesthetic norms or patterns, which vary based on time, which itself is, is a proxy for information. How much users knew about COVID-19 and some related effects at specific moments during that first year of the pandemic's unfolding. And I mentioned too that um, there's a lot of really interesting research in cognitive literary studies. Um, a person who teaches at Stanford, Blakey Vermeule, whose work I admire uh, intensely. This to me is also a cognitive question about uh, how much do you know about something? How does that affect your capacity to then re-narrate to yourself and other people? I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. So we divided the, um, this corpus into two periods um, uh, based on, uh, sorry, this is, and, and this is the, uh, the model. Um, I'd be happy to talk about it. This is um, kind of like toy statistical language, but uh, we're basically just predicting whether the story was written before or after October 1st based on these variables. Okay, so we split the corpus into two periods, um, before and after October 1st, 2020. Although somewhat arbitrary, it falls at the halfway point between when we started and ended our data collection. But more importantly, it's the moment that uh, the global coronavirus death toll topped 1 million. So to us, it was a, a date of great uh, significance. So October 1st, that's when everyone knew that a million people had died from, from COVID. Um, our test was intended to reveal whether stories written before or after the state exhibited distinct differences in authors' decisions about the what and the how of their narratives. We found that stories written after, see these, let's jump into the findings. So we find that stories written after October 1st, 2020 were 30% more likely to possess a social network and 47% less likely to explicitly about COVID-19 in terms of their diegetic story space. Uh, the other variables, control barriers, were uh, uh, were trivial, non significant. Um, I, I find these results really compelling because they're really like kind of elegant, in some ways, kind of in, in a way almost like beautiful. Um, basically, the what and the how captured by the model, in other words, move in opposite directions as a pandemic unfolds. They switch places. And that kind of symmetry I find very uh, elegant. Um, and I find this is a way to visualize this. Um, I'll be happy to talk more about the QA, how we made this. But basically, what I want you to see is again, a sort of like elegant, sort of like human trend. Um, increasingly, the stories that users contribute underneath the hash COVID hashtag are more social. They want to imagine a world with more social interactions, perhaps a response to continued lack of sociality in their own lives, and less explicitly about COVID, suggesting that they'd internalized the new social reality of the pandemic to the point to the point where it became background noise or simply ignored in their fictionalization of social life outside the pandemic's imposed bubbles. That over time, as they knew more about pandemic, the information context, um, these the what and the how essentially trade places they swap. Viewed in aggregate, hashtag COVID writers over time seem to gravitate towards a narrative strategy that privileges stories which richly drawn social spaces over discourse about the pandemic itself. There was a growing realization that perhaps what that the what of the pandemic, or the, of the what of pandemic stories need not refer to the immediate, immediate bodily effects and that the how could help to fill in the, the holes left by those effects. Temporal distance from the pandemic's earliest days, when so much remained unknown, might explain this collective shift from a will to document to a will to fabricate. Again, the story of how COVID became a story is in part the story of how, over time, its fabula and its that trade places in terms of what online authors identify as important to telling this story. Um, and last, I want to understand more about Hashtag COVID, story, hashtag COVID stories spin into Wattpad's broader genre ecosystem, a system that includes numerous other more established literary genres like romance and um, 
mystery. So actually, I think like 70% of stories on Wattpad are either romance or teen. So this is also kind of a story about genre today that's incredibly dominated by romance and teen genres. So um, are the patterns we find unique to COVID or are they merely an effect of all stories in general on the platform during this time? So we need to know the answer to this. Um, excluding our covid variable, of course, because we know that most non-COVID stories are not going to be about COVID, and focusing on the sociality variable, which we find important. Um, so looking at this as now kind of our second model. Um, so we want to know basically like hashtag COVID versus romance and mystery, two other dominant genres on the platform. Looking at sociality, are they different during this time? And what we find is uh, romance and mystery and likely teen and everything else are two to three times more likely to feature a social network than hashtag COVID stories. And the other variables, um, control variables are insignificant. So I was struck by this. Um, our final bit of analysis confirms that hashtag COVID stories represent both a new and distinct genre within the Wattpad genre ecosystem. And what defines their status as say emergent uh, is a relative lack of imagined sociality or connected social life, a lack most likely filled at least in the early months of the pandemic by strong need for sheer information and a sheer will to document. Um, but it also tells us that this dynamic evolves over time as the world knows more about COVID-19 and that correlate with this process is a growing internalization of the pandemic as white noise. A little shout out. And with that turn, hashtag COVID starts looking more like other established genres, the genres that shape, have always shaped our world, romance, mystery, et cetera. What we see is a kind of genre regression, a genre regression to the mean that a literary genre's passage from emergent to dominant in the Raymond Williams sense is in part defined by how it imagines connected social life. Okay, but what did this look like um, at the scale of the page? So, so this, this, this talk would not be complete without actually looking at some, you know, what that stuff. So um, we, got, we got to do it. Um, the stories are kind of awesome. So, um, so this graph uh, very simply plots um, COVIDness versus sociality, and we're interested in stories in the bottom right-hand corner because those are stories with high sociality and very low COVIDness. That these are the stories that are kind of fully mature, mature in the emergent sense. That there's stories that are at the tail end of COVID, and narratologically they have kind of figured it out that they've internalized COVID and they are repopulating their imagined worlds with humans, humans interacting with each other. Um, so, uh, so after, so me and my collaborators, we just spent a week reading a bunch of these stories. They were, many of them were good. Um, and this is what we found. So one thing we noticed, and we didn't, we didn't model this. This is just sort of like the qualitative part of the analysis. Um, we found that a lot of these authors in that, that corner, the bottom right, um, they were eager to imagine an ending for the story of COVID-19, or at least some closure, and they did so by often sublimating the trauma of the pandemic through the narrative resources of fan fiction, or just like existing stories, or story forms or types that already exist or are well or established. They imagine a way out of this reality, not by looking to some future beyond it, but by transposing it onto existing fictional worlds where sociality and characters come pre-built. When surveying works within, within, uh, with the densest character networks and with updates after October 1st, we found many authors weaving the bare facts of the pandemic and especially quarantine life into stuff like Harry Potter, the Avengers, like, like kind of like ridiculous, like fan fiction stuff, One Direction, BTS, anime. <laughs> I had to like ask younger people I know, like, what is this? Japanese Vocaloids. <laughs> There's a TV show entirely about junior high, uh, junior high volleyball. So um, I learned a lot. In these stories, the pandemic seemed to function as a catalyst for forcing established characters into new kinds of relations. So they're very interested in taking humans that they already knew existed, but then putting them into kind of new social configurations. Such rearranged worlds then serve as an opening for newly introduced characters like themselves, autofiction, 
who often feel like projections of the author's own fantasies and traumas, such as when a young girl is sold off to uh, One Direction by her mother and forced to quarantine with Harry Styles. Um, I love that story. Um, that many Wattpad users eventually turn to fan fiction is perhaps not entirely surprising given its centrality on this and other writing platforms. As writers looked around for narrative resources with which to make sense of the pandemic, this was the material closest at hand. And if the infinite ge ge generic permutations inherent to fan fiction do indeed provide an affirmative therapeutic function for readers, as Mark McGurl contends, then we might surmise that in this instance too, writing the pandemic into fan fiction made life a bit more tolerable for both writer and readers alike. Comments by users do suggest that there is much pleasure to be gained in watching fictional characters have to struggle with the mundane details of life under lockdown, which was all of our lives in the early years of COVID. So um, here's one story, again, I promised a close reading. Um, so again, this one was called Life Can Be a Struggle. Um, and it's based, it's sort of modeled on this movie called Songbird, which apparently came out and it was like a Hollywood movie, but no one saw it. And, I, I, I was forced to watch this movie, but um, it was it was the first COVID Hollywood movie. It was amazing, and this fan this 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 Wapa story is modeled off of uh, Songbird. So, uh, released in December 2020, Songbird was conceived at the origin of the pandemic in March, and was the first Hollywood film to go into production. So it's kind of, it was crazy. It was it was filmed during COVID. Um, so uh, the film is a cinema, cinematic version of the early dystopian visions of Wattpad that toyed with the idea of an outbreak na narrative that never ends. It's 2024. We're almost in 2024. The U.S. is still in lockdown. Fortunately, we're not. And life is governed by a massive surveillance uh, state replete with drones and mandatory tests uh, that, if positive, result in deportation to a concentration camp like Q-Zone very uh, dystopic, um, against this backdrop. So in the movie, Sarah Garcia, a young artist living in isolation uh, with her abuela, finds solace in a virtual relationship with a courier, Nico Price, uh, whom she never met in person. But whereas the film offers a brutal, cruel vision of a world where the virus never goes away, the Wattpad story Regent reimagines Sarah as a single mother caring for her young uh, young child, Mal, and turns this, turns this narrative attention to the day-to-day -day interactions between the two. Where we might expect the turn to fan fiction to offer an escape from the matter of factness of life under quarantine, here it's meant to flesh out its excruciating repetitiveness in a sense of helplessness this engenders for Sarah. Instead of scenes that focus on social division and collapse as in the original film, the, the Wattpad story delivers long moments of conversational back and forth between mother and daughter, a whole chapter on teething and the challenges of getting a restless child to sleep, tender scenes of interaction with Sarah's grandmother and with Nico, the character over the phone. It's just, it's just kind of moving stuff, very quotidian. Um, there, there are scenes with which any parent of young children who live through the pandemic can relate. Uh, my co-author, Hoyt Long, uh, has a young child and connected to the story intensely. These are scenes with which any pair, oh, sorry, it was chapter titles like a curious quarantine toddler and quote, the consequences of not listening. Um, the entire story feels firmly rooted in 2020, not 2024. Although just one single story amongst many, life can be a struggle nicely captures a tendency in other highly quote social stories in our data set that also embrace fan fiction to make uh, to start making narrative sense of the pandemic. They tend to borrow the pre-built social worlds of other fictions and map them onto the daily realities of pandemic life. Hashtag COVID stories become more social, not to escape these realities, but to imagine them through someone else, someone they know, someone they like, like Harry Styles, whether for laughs or to project the micro struggles of quarantine onto a grander narrative. Earlier, I described the emergence of the COVID-19 narrative as in part our tempo, temporal regression to genre. Here, close reading suggests that this regression in part means falling back into already existing pre-made stories populated by people you already know and like. Last section. So COVID-19 dramatically upended the world's health, 
economic, political, and social systems. Individuals, institutions, and states were forced to invent, often ad hoc, new ways of organizing political, economic, and social relations in a desperate attempt to contain and manage the disease. Cultural and literary systems were upended too. As Jeremy Rosen and others have argued, much of what drives contemporary culture is the desire for known quantities, giving the reader or viewer more of what they already know and what they already like. Both Hollywood and book publishing from The Avengers to Harry Potter endlessly recycle popular characters in generic storylines, pouring new wine into old bottles. Contemporary culture, including contemporary literature, relies on this feedback loop between producers and consumers. One major outcome of this focus on, again, in the McGraw sense, customer service, is to reinforce the market dominance of genre fiction, such as science fiction and romance, which thrive on predictable and familiar character types and storylines. But it also narrows the cultural field's attention to a relatively finite amount of intellectual property or IP. Star Wars, Game of Thrones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After COVID-19, a gap opened up between this finite familiar space and a new reality for which known storylines were inadequate at best, irrelevant at worst. Suddenly there was a new world to explain that nothing could explain it. If the pandemic was a kind of stress test on our contemporary cultural marketplace, as well as existing political health and economic systems, it revealed how dramatic social shifts create openings for new genres of writing that briefly alter the terms of this customer service model. A year into the pandemic, mainstream literary culture has only begun to explore. So I got excited about this. So when we were finishing this article, we, we saw like these like constant stream of New York Times articles about famous writers being like, I'm gonna write the COVID-19 novel. Like I'm, I'm gonna go for it. So, um, so one of these uh, kind of cool ideas was uh, in March, 2021, um, Margaret Atwood, champion of Wattpad, uh, announced that she got a bunch of her friends together, Dave Edgars, uh, John Grisham, Celeste Eng, and they would co-author a quote, unique collaborative novel set in a single tenement in New York City during the early months of the pandemic. Each author would choose and serve as the voice of a character living in the tenement, each spinning out a story about the experience of being stuck in time together. 14 days, edited by Atwood um, and scheduled for release. Uh, so it's gonna come out in 2023 uh, by Random House, was already billed as the first major novel about the pandemic. Instead of stubbornly waiting like DeLillo for history to unfold, these established writers were acting more like the online denizens of Wattpad, collectively learning from one another ad hoc and in media's rest, how to tell a, to how to tell a story about a world in crisis. But Atwood, as well as now a long list of writers, Ann Tyler, Ian McEwen, Louise Erdrich, uh, who by 2022 had, had also begun to write novels um, that include some aspect of the pandemic, were late to the party. These writers are wrestling with many of the same questions that Wattpad authors had already learned how to negotiate in their own way. When is it too soon to re recreate the atmosphere of a terrible tragedy? tragedy? How, do you, how to turn what was for many a boring apocalypse into a gripping story? And how to capture the texture of daily life lived in isolation, stasis, and unending monotony? Atwood's 14 Days um, project, for example, bears an uncanny similarity to Lockdown on London Lane, the story I began my talk with. Up to this point, observes uh, critic Daniel Mendelson, you couldn't yet have the great coronavirus because we didn't know how it was going to end yet. When it does, when it eventually does, um, surely it's going to be one of these writers who, who will be remembered for the great coronavirus novel. But shouldn't we also learn how to read the protean shifting story roles that precede this hardening into a final literary form? It's through websites like Wattpad that we catch a glimpse of literature responding to social upheaval as it's happening and in parallel with the noise of our contemporary media ecosystem. It's a glimpse of how, large, how a large group of amateur writers collectively writing on the web in response to each other minute by minute, day by day, figured out how to tell a story before they knew how it would end. Thank you.
Oh, um, could, you, could you put my last slide up just uh, for a second? I need to uh, credit some people. So I wrote this uh, material with uh, Hoyt Long at Chicago and my graduate student, Kate, Caitlin Todd. And um, if you're interested in this, um, it's going to be published at Critical Inquiry in a half year as that. So I'm um, happy to send preprints for anyone interested. Thank you. You can, um, yeah. Thanks to Richard and your collaborators for this wonderful talk. One thing that jumped into my head, which might be totally irrelevant, but what I remember about the early days of COVID is that there was a lot of focus on lack of access to internet that folks, middle schoolers, high schoolers who had getting, been able to get internet at their school or in a public library suddenly lost access to that because of lockdown. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, do people have enough bandwidth for doing school at home? If Wattpad and other systems do trend young, um, and I don't know how representative they are of demographics either in Canada or the United States, do you think there was any impact on who was writing or even who was reading due to the loss of internet access in the first couple of months? Yeah, um, I would say in North America, what you might call first world countries, I think we have some finding ways to write because you often write on the phones. But for places where there's more limited um, internet services, um, uh, so, Wattpad is really big in the Philippines. Um, I think COVID affected their access to the internet more intensely. And I think there was a kind of um, siloing of, like, say, North America and like other parts of the world. Um, so I think it. I don't think it necessarily impacted young people in that way. But I think it impacted um, the capacity for people from different parts of the world to write their story. The, the change in trends over time might also be a proxy for more people in like India and India. Uh, hi, hi, thanks a lot for this talk. It's pretty inspiring. I've got a very simple question. That is, uh, as you mentioned before, many users join in this fiction writing because of an impulse to talk and this is, discuss this event. So I've got a feeling that probably the boundary between personal experience sharing and discussion and fiction writing becomes increasingly blurred. How do you deal with this situation during this project? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, that's a great question. Um, She's written on this well. She's very interested in what she calls the increasing indistinction of literature. I find this to be a very generated concept. Uh, concept the, indis the growing indistinction of literature, which means that um, probably increasingly, just like the nature publishing, the rise of so called fiction, there's more to line between first person, you know, memoir and fiction. What I really find that young people, when they write stuff on the web, the stories, there's a very, there's an incredible gray area between the different categories of writing, like writing to write a story versus writing their personal memoir. Now, the indistinction is really intense for them. And I just don't think that they really self categorize. So we didn't self categorize, we didn't categorize, we didn't separate them. That when they go to Wattpad, and they label their story a story, they believe they're writing a story. They believe it's fiction and the stories. And that's what we really want to understand. So I think what we're capturing in the, 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 the trends, oh, thank you, um, is the changing like ratio of that indistinction, right? So over time, in the beginning, what it meant to write a story for a lot of these young people is just like processing stuff. They're like, this is crazy, this is going on. And that's their story. They believe it was a story. And what the model shows is that that the that 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 changing nature of a kind of COVID fictionality is changed. That's what that's what we're capturing over time. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, should we give them the mic or? Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> sure. I was struck during your talk that you mentioned now that it's over, but it seems we have a kind of natural experiment going on in places where it's not over, like the repeated uh, lockdowns and quarantines in China. It almost seems like Groundhog Day there. Uh, are you seeing any effects there in the way uh, 
that it's uh, uh, treated by uh, authors in that country? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. What I, what I find really compelling about Wattpad is it's sort of global simultaneity and users from different parts of the world, different countries are constantly interacting and often it's a share information. And so absolutely. So in China where uh, they're still pursuing a COVID zero policy, certainly their storytelling is pegged to a reality that feels like 2021 for us, even though it's now no longer 2021 for us. So that kind of uneven temporality, I think would be fascinating. What we've seen in the data so far is, um, yeah, like it's confusing because they are, it's part of the kind of recursive feedback loop of these websites and that users in China can read other stories written by people in America. So it's confusing for them because they're reading stories that represent a world where COVID's over, but that doesn't map onto their realities, right? So their stories reflect sometimes a kind of contradiction or like, you know, some, some confusion, right? Because the majority of their fellow Wattpad writers live in a world where COVID is more or less complete, even if it doesn't map onto the reality. So their stories themselves index that kind of unevenness of temporality and experience, which is super interesting, right? From a kind of storytelling perspective. Yeah. Um, hi, so thank you so much for the talk. I really appreciated that you looked through the fan, like the pandemic through like a fan fiction lens because that is something I hadn't really considered before and it was an interesting take. Uh, my question is basically why you stuck to Wattpad because there are other um, fan fiction websites out there. So why did you use mostly Wattpad? Um, thanks. And uh, just I want to quickly mention to you because there's a lot of fun parts with this. Um, my collaborator Hoyt Long and I, um, because all this, because we don't belong to the generation that uses Wattpad. We thought it was important that we try writing stories as a kind of like self-experiment on ourselves to get into the community. We actually, we, we ended up not doing that because it just seemed ridiculous, but um, it's, there's a real generational gap, you know? And I think like, I, I, I say this in response to your question because um, we just chose Wattpad because it's the most popular and populated website. It's it's really a big deal. It's, 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 it's numbers are probably closer to like 120 million users just as a benchmark. Twitter is, I think, like 400 million users where maybe half of them are bots, you know? So like the, the number of WAP and its growth is exponential. So its growth curve is steeper than Twitter. So this is a really big deal that I think for people of my generation where like WAPAD is like this random weird thing. It's, it's really important for young people and it's extremely significant and the numbers bear that out. So we chose WAPAD just simply because it's really mainstream popular. But yeah, AO3, um, and these other like, you know, new uh, platforms were that are more experimental, avant-garde. So AO3 is particularly say queer friendly, I know, and that would be a kind of different thing. So I think, I mean, I think this work is 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 relatively new, and we need to do more of it and look at other kinds of platforms and compare them. This is just really a first pass at a big problem, and that's what we decided to focus on. Yeah. Richard, uh, here's a question from the virtual audience. Uh, I'm curious, this person writes, about the sociality measure and how you and your team decided on the metric. When you say it measures how many characters interact in the story and create a network, does interaction include non-in-person interactions such as phone call conversations or text messages? In addition, have you and your collaborators considered other ways or elements to include when measuring sociality? And if so, how did you arrive at this measure in the end? Okay, oh, thanks so much for that question. Um, the, the kind of guts of the modeling I find really interesting and, I, and I, I'm grateful for questions that push. So um, the way that we defined it, and there's gonna be errors, so we had to automate this. Uh, we use an algorithm. Uh, my friend and collaborator, David Bamman, who's a computer scientist at Berkeley, um, he's actually gonna be on campus in a couple of days, he's fantastic. So um, the way that they've been modeling social networks and stories is um, using a package that extracts characters and identifies scenes and so forth. Um, the characters had to really be present or interacting within the diegesis of the story, meaning that in the real world life of the story, they had to be, so it couldn't be a telephone call, 
it couldn't be a virtual or mediated discussion because we really want sociality to mean that there were humans having a kind of embodied intimate experience, right? Or not, right? So it couldn't be like Zooming with someone. That's what the model picks up. So, and there had to be more than two people having those kind of interactions within the diegesis of the story. But it raises really interesting questions. Like we thought of it, it just was too hard. We couldn't figure out how to do it, but it'd be interesting to have another variable that would be like mediated sociality. So like we could capture every instance of like people in the story talking by telephone or by Zoom, which would be a different kind of metric too. And that would be interesting to plot that against so-called real life human interaction within the diegesis of the story. So I would just say that this was a first pass of kind of hard modeling problem. It's just really hard to model narrative aspects. This is really at the cutting edge of computational humanities work. So this was a kind of course attempt at a very, very hard problem. And my collaborator, David Bamman, has been doing uh, cutting edge stuff in this area. Thank you so much for that, for that talk. Um, I have just a, a technical question also. You mentioned that you, uh, you limited your study to a thousand words. And I'm wondering why that limit, um, especially since you're comparing it later to novels that are longer form. So I was wondering if there were questions of kind of short form, form versus long form, um, how, you know, wh what those considerations would be. And, and did you just sort of an anecdotally look at, I don't know if the platform has a limit, word limit, um, but you know, there's one, that, you know, that's sort of the, the social media conventions are much shorter versus the, you know, the mainstream publishing is going to be much longer. Um, so what did you find? Did you, did you look at longer uh, form pieces that were published and kind of glean anything just from, you know, sort of informally? Just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, um, so I think I misspoke that we, we included stories a thousand words or longer. Right, but but your question raises a really interesting question, you know, really interesting questions about like genre and just like length. I mean, kind of like a boring thing for literary scholars, but a really, really important one about in terms of like the social media age, right? Where like the length, length is really important for determining genre in many ways. But yeah, I think we, we just for like, to make this make sense, we removed all the super short. So there were like thousands of super short stories under a thousand words, which we had to cut out because they were kind of creating noise, but those were interesting, you know, because all, sometimes they were like one sentence, they're like, like, I'm freaking out, COVID's crazy, end story, like end scene, you know, and that, you know, because um, one, one of my friends, um, uh, John Muse, uh, who's a theater scholar, he works on micro short dramas, and sometimes they're like, person comes in, gunshot, and that's the play. So that's that's a legit genre of, of you know, fictionality, drama. And so a lot of COVID stories, that was their story. They'd be like, COVID happened, I'm extremely upset, and story. And we couldn't really model them using the way that we were doing it, but I think there would be another kind of interesting category of the COVID genre with its own kind of features and properties that we just haven't really figured out. In terms of, a thousand words and above, like the medium length and the super long, they kind of, they, there wasn't a big difference, which was really surprising to us. In terms of like our variables, super long, 1000 words, that, 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 that's, you know, that limit, it was strange, yeah. But the super, super short, yeah, we don't, we don't really know yet. So I'm curious about a distinction you made in the middle of your talk between um, the will to document versus the will to fabulate. Um, and then the phrase you used a number of times, which is, you know, a, a problem that doesn't, or a story that you don't know how it, how it ends. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a third category that you might use, which is like the will to make sense, right? right? You know, so that, that the analogies I was thinking about, well, less about pandemic narratives and more about uh, narratives in in catastrophes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you know the the earthquake in Chile, mm -hmm. the short story that shakes a certain kind of consciousness th that really makes sense because of its inconclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm curious about like the ways in which inconclusiveness may actually be the thing that makes for the genre itself. Right. That that's 
Thank you for that formulation. It's 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 so great. Um, you're totally right. Something that I've been thinking about with my computational narratology friends, where we just talk about this, is you know narratives. You know, like a big part of the function is exactly how to say it, is to explain things, right? It's like explanation, fabulation, right? You tell a story to represent the world, to organize in some way. But sometimes you need to tell a story just to like, yeah, make it make sense to explain the reality. And that's something that is, is strong and, and, and you're right, you know, that would be another framework, like another variable in our model, right? And so one, I think that's a great idea, right? That the narratological function, right, of explanatory power, right? Because I think some COVID writers just cognitively, they just gave up. They're like, the world is insane, that's it. I'm not even gonna attempt to explain. Others use a genre to precisely explain that they had a whole narrative to be like, this is happening because of blah, right? Some of them were like, unfortunately, like, you know, China conspiracy theory stuff. But other times they were like, this is happening because of like failed nation states, right? Or like the limitations of the world, you know, like there were explanations. Um, so I really like that idea a lot. And I really like the idea too, right? That um, part of the major feature of COVID stories, right? Is that precisely because it's inconclusive. You can't really know. It is impossible to have that that narrative arc complete. Is a defining feature of the COVID story. And yeah, things like um, like mysteries, right? So there's probably like religious genres, right? Where there's a miracle, you'll never know really why it happened, and that probably is constitutive of certain like mystery or religious genres that would be interesting if they're similar to COVID stories, right? That inconclusiveness. Yeah. Well, I mean, or even. Which is like it's not fully explicable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like something terrible happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um the pandemic happened, people died, and people behaved the way they behaved, and the behavior, the behavioral pattern of human beings all over the world have been captured and it has become a story. Now, you have captured them with data using the word path as an example to explain the story. Now, how does the behavioral patterns of human beings ensure adequate management in the next pandemic? How does human, how does human behavior reduce death during the next pandemic, which is definitely going to happen? Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for your question. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a literary scholar, and we're kind of skeptical of like engineering social solutions to like broad. Uh, we're more in the kind of descriptive, explanatory mode. Um, but I, I'm grateful to your question because um, that I I I there's a lot of interesting work um, also by social psychologists. There's a lot of people working in this space. The value of Wattpad and the potential value of studies like this, but a lot of social psycho psychological research is on having having in real time documents of how people were responding in the early days to this terrible thing that was happening, right? Because that provides useful information about if it happens again, how, how can we help people communicate with people? How can we better understand psychologically, mentally, affectively what they're going through? Because now we have some documentation in terms of how they're telling this, the story of their experience of pandemic. And that to me is useful knowledge or information. Um, so I don't, I, I, this is really not my area to propose solutions. I have spoken to medical researchers and policy people that are interested in this work. Um, and again, social psychologists have been doing lots of um, case studies, tests, right, to just learn more about the human experience of processing, internalizing this terrible thing that happens as potential information towards therapeutic measures, et cetera, for unfortunately, if another pandemic happens. I will say, I spent a lot of time reading Wattpad stories and what I found very moving and helpful is that a lot of people went on Wattpad, millions of people for, for a kind of therapeutic purpose that going on Wattpad helped them through the pandemic. Like I truly believe that happened. And 
from a purely like policy perspective, which is again, not my bailiwick, but like if someone wants to do this, Wattpad can be improved or can be reconstituted in a way that can be an even more hospitable place for people suffering during a pandemic to write stories that help them in some way, help them process, just help them deal with grief, et cetera. So I, I, I do believe that. Thanks for this, Richard. Um, I wanted to ask a, a more, another sort of more technical question about your modeling here, mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that's really striking about sort of internet um, publication platforms like Wattpad or AO3 or similar is the way that the publication is not always, but typically sort of serial. I mean, not in the case of sort of the pandemic happened, I don't know what to do, this is awful, the end, <laughs> right? But the sort of model that's like, I don't know what to do. This is awful. The pandemic is happening. And then like updates. And then this is sort of where I'm sort of interested in your use of the like last updated metric because last updated, say September 12th might mean a story that was begun at the very beginning that maybe started out as what on earth is happening or maybe started out as like in June as sort of like Harry Potter, but also COVID um and got some regular updates and then it reached a natural conclusion or very frequently right also like got some updates and never reached a conclusion because you know these are not necessarily professional authors these are almost certainly not professional authors in most cases who have lives that intervene who have lives in the middle of the pandemic that maybe intervened more than they otherwise would um so when you sort of pick a story and you say this was last updated in November, that's actually quite a lot of different possibilities, right? Maybe that story was started in November, but maybe that story was and never updated because it was supposed to be complete or it was immediately abandoned. But it could also be a story from the beginning of the pandemic that actually was elaborated on at quite considerable length. So I was just wondering like what metrics are available on Wattpad in terms of like beginning composition, regularity of updates and stuff. Um, and also how you were sort of thinking through this kind of problem of like publication, not as a sort of event, but as a, an ongoing kind, uh, process. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's one that we really struggled with. We didn't, we didn't have a good solution to this. So unfortunately, my answer is not totally satisfying insofar as we just picked last date modified as a kind of core solution to a complicated problem. Um, because a lot of these stories were created like way before, but then they became, you know, during the pandemic, pandemic stories, and we were interested in those stories. Um, I would say like a more sophisticated version of this would be, um, you have information on the website when the store was first created and last modified, so two dates. And I think what should be in any kind of future work, some kind of variable would be like, internally, is there a change in these metrics, right? Is a story becoming more social, like before and after, right? Like uh, last modified or like creation, it could just become more complex, right? To see if, and that'd be kind of interesting, right? If there's a separate category story that started off really lonely, right? It became super social, right? Um, or like started out super about COVID and stayed super about COVID. It's just another dimension. To characterizing these stories that we just hadn't really figured out how to do, but it'd be a good thing to do. But yeah, that's a great question. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just to refresh, how many stories was it you were looking at? It was like 1,500? About 2,000. Was that all the hashtag COVID stories? Uh, that we could see. Okay. Because yeah. my big takeaway be, beyond the analysis is just that number because of that's less than half an hour's worth of stories posted to Wattpad over the year, right? And it's just a shockingly low representation of a massive event. Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about like the potential of a new strain or crisis to disrupt the generic system and it's like it didn't seem to disrupt it very much you're still getting most of what was there um and that's that's just like a shocking result to me and speaks to these larger conversations about 
you know, the unrepresentability and underrepresentation of infectious diseases, especially in novels and in fiction. Um, I am curious, though, about if there was any correlation with like these very short texts and then being tagged hashtag COVID, like the stuff that doesn't even look like a normal story representing COVID directly. And I'm curious about like, did you run analyses of the COVIDness of stuff that wasn't tagged hashtag COVID um, to see COVIDness, say, in romance or in teens also spiking? Yeah, that's super interesting. So the first question, um, those numbers are a bit deceptive because of the platform. I would say we looked at all the stories, it was maybe like 10,000, but we'd get rid of most of them because they're so short. But it's also only what you can see in the, the, the website. So you can only see at any time, like maybe 10,000 romance stories, but there are probably 20 million. So I would say the actual, my estimate of the actual number of COVID stories would be like a lot, like maybe 50,000. But to your point, it is completely dwarfed by the other genres. So I would say each day during this, maybe like there were 50 COVID stories every day and maybe like 2000 romance stories. So there was a lot of COVID writing, but again, it's just, it's just that it's hard to disrupt the genre system where people just wanna kind of fall back and still write romance stories even during COVID, which gets to your second question, which is really interesting that, I suspect a lot of the popular genre stories actually had like COVIDness to them and using an algorithm to identify those and learning about them would be super interesting. That, that is because also you don't really want to write an explicit hashtag COVID story because people are going to read them. People read romance, you got to hashtag them romance, you know. So there's something to be said about how hard it is for new genres to emerge in general in the world and the, the sheer inertia of, of like romance, mystery which is like Mark McGraw's point in his book to a certain extent, yeah. Richard will be back tomorrow for a round table event and Giovanna will tell us the details. Warrenburg Hall, and the title is Computation and Culture in the Era of Digital Media. And we are going to bring together Richard in conversation with uh, Professor Mark McGur from English, Professor Shang Li from Communications, and DJ Yang from Computer Science. So there will be space and a new space both for these methodological and technical questions and understanding and exploring more of how they relate to this moment in our culture. And you're all welcome to come and I can give you also more specific directions if you go on the website for SESTA or talk to me and I put it back. Great, thank you. We hope, you, uh, we hope a lot of you will wanna join the roundtable event tomorrow. After the roundtable, we have here at, this, at the Humanity Center, we have a lot more events coming up in the near future. Um, just to mention the next two, uh, two weeks from today in this space at this time, uh, the sociologist Ruha Benjamin, uh, and uh, just about a week after that on October 27th, uh, the, also in this space, uh, the literary scholar Sadia Hartman. In that case, it is uh, the annual presidential lecture in the humanities, which is one of our biggest events of the year. So all those events uh, are like all of our events, hybrid. So you can join us in person or online. Now, for those of you who are, and everything is on our website, shc.stanford.edu. Now, for those of you who are here in person, we hope you will join us outside for a reception at which we can continue the conversation with Richard So. And for those of you who are with us virtually, we hope to see you next time, either in person or virtually. And so until then, thanks for joining us. <laughs>